Blue Valley Network of Companies is proud to host this event in conjunction with USDA Rural Development. A big thank you to Patty Clark for her role in developing the concept, sending out invitations, and lining up speakers on our, our after off meeting. Uh, my name is Terry Morse. I'm the President and Board of Directors of Blue Valley Telecommunications and the Network of uh, Blue Valley Network of Companies. And uh, I live in the big city of Wheaton, Kansas, down in Pottawatomie County. So it's a welcome to see you all here this morning. We are excited to bring all of you together today to discuss some very important issues surrounding the rural telecommunications industry, including telecommunications, technological advancements, agriculture, community and economic development, education, and workforce development. We have some of the leading experts in the field with us today to give us some updates, insights, hopefully sparks some discussion. We invite you to join us for a box lunch immediately following the event. If you can, please do so and engage in the discussion. If you can't, which we completely understand everyone is busy, we encourage you to gather a box to take with you. Again, we'd like to thank you for making the time to join us today. Technology is changing and advancing every day. It is through efforts such as this that we become leaders and drivers in our industries. So with that, I'd like to remind everyone to silence your phones and, and we will introduce, and it's my privilege to introduce our first speaker today. Brian Thompson, CEO of the Blue Valley Network of Companies, which includes Blue Valley Telecommunications, Inc. and Networks Plus. Brian has over 34 years of experience in the telecommunications industry, including tenure at Verizon, TW Telecom, and Endeavor Communications. He has been the recipient of numerous industry awards, including most recently, a National Executive Leadership Award. He holds a bachelor's degree in business management from Indiana Wesleyan University. Brian was recently selected to deliver a presentation at the TEDx Topeka event. His passion and commitment to rural communications, technological advancements in the industry, as well as those in agriculture or infectious, which you will see firsthand in just a moment when Brian shares the presentation he gave just a month ago at the TEDx stage. Brian currently holds board positions for the following organizations, Kansas Fiber Network, State Independent Telephone Association, Marshall County Partnership for Growth, and Team Kansas. In addition, he chairs the Political Action Committee for the Kansas Rural Independent Telecommunications and the Innovative and Technology Committee for NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association. So please join me in welcoming Brian Thomas. Thanks, Harry, and good morning again, and thank you all for coming. This happens to us real people all the time. <laughs> We're thrilled to have you all here today, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to share a few thoughts with you today as well. And I want to start doing that right now. I want to share with you an experience that I had in 2015. In 2015, I went to a meeting of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Sound really excited. Huh? Catching up on your seats may have been probably looks a lot more interesting to you already. I know you may not believe me, but what we talked about there is going to affect each and every one of you. What we talked about there is going to matter to you because I'm guessing you had breakfast this morning. Or maybe you plan on eating something later today. More important. If you plan on living for another 35 years, then what we talked about there is really going to be interesting. You see, there's a big challenge coming. In 35 years, there's going to be another 2 billion people on the planet. Yep, our population is going to expand from 7.2 billion to 9.6 billion by the year. Challenge is, what are all these people going to eat with farmland across America that's decreasing? What are we all going to eat when, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization, local food production will need to double 
by the year 1850. When America saw its 8 million acres of farmland between 2007 and 2012, how do we produce twice as much of less? I don't know about you, but I really enjoy eating. And I know it's a huge problem when production can't keep pace with population. However, as big as this problem is, we think we have some good ideas of how we can help people. At this meeting in New York, there was a panel on how broadband technology <coughs> On the panel were speakers from universities across the United States, the South Dakota Utilities Commissioner, and the CEO of the World Telecommunications Company. I was there on the panel because I've been in the telecommunications field for now 35 years. Today, I work to help provide high-speed broadband to rural portions. Well, all the experts sitting on the panel had the technical know-how about agriculture and about technology in general. I knew that really talking about this problem meant that someone was missing from the discussion. Where were the farmers? Just who are these people who will be responsible for doubling their harvest in the next 35 years? Where was their invitation to these farmers? Frankly, before I even went to I knew that I didn't know everything that I needed to know to talk on a panel about how broadband technology can support farming. Here I was trying to provide a service to rural communities, but what did I really know about their challenges? What did I know about farming and about the families who are dedicated to producing the food of American Americans? So to find out, I went on a tour of four family farms across Kansas. Talking with the Pringle, Splitter, Bronco, and Dresden families, I learned something that changed my perspective on the problem of this. I learned that if we're really going to be successful, it's going to take more than just technology. I arrived at the Pringle farm around 8 a.m. after a three hour drive. Megan Pringle met me outside of her home and said that she had breakfast for and smell this wonderful egg casserole as I walked into the kitchen. Craig Pringle was sitting there with one of their best friends who's also in the agricultural business. As we ate, he shared with me the history of their family farming, including how their family had been farming for generations. We talked for hours about precision farming and how the lack of broadband was impacting their ability to fully utilize. The visit to the splitter farm came literally hours before the start of the office. Matt Splitter did not have time to do that. Have a time. We met in the cab of his John Deere tractor as he shared with me how he had come back to work with Family Farm after his father. With a lot of hard work, he had turned their operation from a few hundred acres into a few However, Matt had specific expectations on how broadband technology was going to help us farm even more productive. I'd met Glenn Brunkow many times before arriving at his farm for a tour. The night before my visit, Kansas had one of our unexpected heavy rains, and there was water everywhere. We first walked out through a very muddy barnyard to barbecue a couple of young calves. And after those tours were completed, Lynn and I rode this pickup truck to another portion of the family farm that had been in the Bronco family for many years. The final stop on the tour was to the Dresden farm. We first met in their family home where a young Adam Dresden shared with me how he began to use a drone to help his farm be more productive. Our company's video producer was with me that day, and Adam gave her the opportunity to fly that drone before we left. I won't lie to you all, that was a really scary thing for me to watch her do. 
These operations that I visited across Kansas were all different. However, they had some things in common as well. First of all, they had a commitment to farm. It's a mission for them to grow crops and to make their harvest better every year. However, they only have a limited time to do that. Howard Buffett, Warren Buffett's son once said, each of us has about 40 chances in life to accomplish our goals. I learned this first through agriculture as every farmer can expect to have about 40 growing seasons, giving them 40 chances to improve on every harvest. However, the family farms that I visited in 2015, along with about 2 million other operations across the United States, only have 35 years to double the harvest that they currently produce, not 40. The second thing that these family farms all had in common was they expressed no real desire to do anything other than keep their multi-generational farms successful. So that brings us back to our panel in New York. How can we help farmers be more successful and address the very real problem of feeding billions of more people in just a few decades? What can the broadband industry do to help, including small rural communications companies like the one that I run? The answer is that we have to provide fiber optic cable technology, not just to the cities, but to those farms too. Not because companies will make a lot of money providing them with this technology, but because our ability to eat in the future depends upon those farmers having it. I know you may be thinking that farmers will need some wonder technology that hasn't been invented yet, but that's just not true at all. There's already a lot of exciting new developments. Every farmer that I spoke with was very open to using precision farming techniques. We have the tools right now to make sure that there's food on each and every one of our tables for decades to come. However, there's often one very important element missing, access to high-speed internet. If farmers had access to broadband and fiber technology, there are five major ways that every farmer could be better right now. First of all, they can make better use of soil now. Three of the four farms that I visited currently use this technology. Soil mapping allows farms to visually lay out their acreage based upon where the most fertile soil is. You see dirt differs depending on mineral content, moisture content, runoff, and a lot of other factors that can impact the yields. With soil mapping, this gives them the ability to most effectively plant seed and apply fertilizer based upon the variations of the land within a given field. This is amazing to do. However, the data files used to transmit soil mapping information are huge and therefore take up a tremendous amount of blood. The Dressman Farm currently uses wireless technology for their broadband, but it's just simply not good enough. Many times they may have to go to their local library to get the quality of internet that they need. If they had fiber optic cable to their farm, they'd be better able to utilize soil mapping information and make better decisions even faster. Second tool that they use is GPS. You and I may use GPS for travel, but farmers use GPS for precision farming. One farmer described to me sensor planters that give them the ability to plant just the right amount of seed and avoid overplanting. This resulted in an 8% reduction in seed cost and less soil production. Precision farming data will often be sent by farmers to different vendors and organizations to make sure that their farm is being as productive as it possibly can. However, again, these data files are very large only best be transported through the use of fiber optic technology. 
third way that fiber optic technology can help us through the monitoring of irrigation and feeding systems. The splitter farm has 20 irrigation lanes. If Matt Splitter had access to fiber optic and broadband technology, he'd be better able to monitor these wells and make better use of our precious water supply. In fact, as we sat in the cab of that John Deere tractor that hot afternoon, Matt shared with me his intent to place fiber optic cable himself from his farm a significant distance to the nearest local rural communications company. Recently, Matt told me that he had indeed done that. He had placed that cable because having that technology was that important to him. It's also important for all of us to remember that farms are businesses too. And so keeping them viable means that they need to watch the markets. In 2012, 75% of all farming operations across the United States had sales of less than $50,000. Margins are tied in. Keeping real-time access to market data through the use of fiber optic technology will be absolutely critical for us to ensure that farmers can remain successful years ago. One farmer shared with me that hourly swings in market prices can have a 45% impact to their bottom line. This can mean thousands of dollars of difference. With high speed internet, keeping sure keeping more farmers viable will be one of the key elements to make sure that all farms can remain successful for years to come and help us ensure that production can keep pace. Finally, fiber technology can be used to support operational audiences. Of course, there's software available right now, but if a hard drive crashes, then all that financial information would be lost. Farmers that I spoke with would like to use the software on the cloud. However, they need the kind of technology that only fiber optic cable can provide in order to use the service in the first place. These technologies are all important for us to ensure that farmers can improve their harvest over the next 35 years. They have the tools today to help them be better farmers. But they need our Three of the four family farms that I visited currently use wireless technology, but had to limit the use of this technology because of cost. And again, if they had access to the internet at all, it may have been only through their local library. If we want to make sure that everyone, and I mean everyone, knows where their next meal is coming from. It's absolutely critical that we give farmers the support that they need now. I know that access to fast internet can make a difference in feeding the world. Our farmers know it can make a difference. Now the question is, can you make a difference? Absolutely, and you don't have to be a farmer either. Each and every one of us has choices about what we buy, where we buy it from, and what we know about the future. There's a lot of emphasis on getting access to high-speed internet to the cities. But we need to make sure that we're supporting access to high-speed internet to those who need it the most. Most importantly, we need to be interested in what farmers need to get the job done. It's not just about tractor season spring. They need ways to track production. They need ways to stay connected to the resources. They need. And yes, they may even need things that haven't been created. But with your help and with the help of others, these are things that can't get done. I guess if I could tell you one thing, it would be this. Be interested in farmers. Talk to farmers. Listen to their problems. Work with them to create solutions. Your lunch depends on
your family's dinner table, the whole world. When I left the conference in 2015, I came away with a greater appreciation for the role that rural communications companies play in helping people. The event may have been in Times Square, but my heart and mind were in Kansas, and really across all of So, what's for breakfast? And more importantly, what's for breakfast in the next 35 years? That's entirely up to you and me. What we decide to do today costs a quarter million dollars. Thank you. Now, technology is impacting agriculture today. We have uh, Glenn Bronco, Kansas Farm Bureau, Anthony Edwards, FFA student, and Drew Overmar, the FFA advisor for Valley Heights. So, uh, with bio here, we have uh, Glenn Bronco. Glenn is a fifth generation farmer rancher in the Flint Hills of Northeast Kansas. He and his wife Jennifer and their kids Isaac and Tatum raise cattle, sheep, and crops with his father. Glenn is a graduate of Kansas State University with a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics and a master's degree in agronomy. And he told me a little bit ago that the reason he was late this morning, he had a pair of twin plans for him, so, you know, business comes first. He is an outspoken advocate for agriculture. Much of, it, much of this he attributes to his passion for farming and ranching. Most little kids want to be baseball players or astronauts when they grow up. Glenn only wanted to follow in his parents' footsteps. His advocacy, advocacy, advocacy efforts were honored, grown, and developed through his involvement with Kansas Farm Bureau. Glenn currently is on the Kansas Farm Bureau Board of Directors and represents the First District. He has served as chair of the Young Farmer and Ranch Committee for Kansas Farm Bureau and as a member of the National Committee for the American Farm Bureau. He was also chosen as a member of the Partners in Ag Leadership class of the American Farm Bureau. Glenn is also a graduate of the Masters in Beef Advocacy class through NCBA. He is also the author of a weekly column called Dust on the Dashboard. Mainly, Glenn just loves to tell anyone about his love for agriculture. And Anthony is a senior at Valley Heights High School in Blue Rapids, Kansas. He has been involved in MFA for the duration of his high school career. During this time, Anthony has held various leadership positions, including class representative, FFA parliamentarian and historian. Anthony has completed numerous agricultural classes, including Intro to Agriculture, Agriculture Welding, and Agri-Science. He currently has a 3.65 cumulative GPA. In addition to all his school activities, Anthony has worked as a farm assistant and laborer since 2012. His responsibilities have included livestock health care, equipment operation, day-to-day -day operations, cultivation, inspections, and more. And as I said, and as I said Drew Obermeyer is the FMA advisor for Valley Heights High School. So I'm going to turn uh, the microphone over to Glenn Bronco. Well, thank you, Terry. And, and as Terry said, I was a little bit late today. I, I went out and did the 530 U check and nothing. Everybody was chewing their cud looking at me. I thought, I've got clear sail. Went out at 7 o'clock. She had a set of twins. They're doing well. We've got moved around, but it did cost me a little time. So it is a real honor to be here today. Uh, and I cannot tell you how much uh, it means to be here. I can't tell you how much we appreciate Blue Valley and what they do. Brian's a little modest. When he said that the three of the four that he visited didn't have wireless technology, was I your only customer? I have wireless technology. So Blue Valley has invested in their area, uh, at least in my part of the world, Westmoreland, and uh, it has made a tremendous difference. Uh, before Blue Valley, we had Sprint. Mom said, Mom always told me, if you don't have something good to say about anybody, you don't say it, so that's as far as we're going to go. <laughs> but Blue Valley came in and they made a tremendous difference. We went from dial up, and now we have high speed wireless fiber to our house. At the time that Brian started talking to me about this, uh, my wife and I were involved in, in a uh, business. Uh, we were a, a franchise uh, 
for a, a company that we were selling RFID tags to bee producers. We would take the, the information that they gave us, we'd take large data uh, spreadsheets and we'd send them in um, to, to the mother company and they'd download it and be in the database. We were sending large spreadsheets and before, before we had uh, the high-speed wireless and fiber to our house, we had dial-up, we'd start one of those uh, databases, we'd start one of the spreadsheets, send it, and then we'd go off for 30, 45 minutes and do something else, and hope that we didn't time out. They came, the, the, the uh, fiber came, and it was like that. We no longer are part of that business now, um, but there are so many things that it makes such a big difference. I got to think about this today. Uh, we do, we try to do all of our business locally. We do as much business as we can, but there are some things that we cannot buy locally that we, we go online and we order. Um, and, and those of you here will appreciate a lot of that is with Valley Bet. Um, you know, it's so much easier for me to go online and order my vaccine, order order what I need from Valley Bet rather than drive the 45 minutes up here. You know, and, and spend an hour and a half, I can order that and in a day, two days, I have it in my doorstep. So the commerce that, that we do, the things that we buy, uh, it makes a tremendous difference. You talked about the, the soil map, the, uh, uh, the different technology, and that's stuff that, what was it, how long ago was it we did the video? Not very many years ago, and that really was just coming on the horizon. So in three or four years, I, I can't imagine what, what we're gonna be doing, and we have to have that high-speed uh, access. We have to have that, that uh, you know, fiber optic card farms. It, it's been an eye-opening experience for me too being on the Farm Bureau Board. There's 13 of us on the Farm Bureau Board. One of the things that we're expected to have is the internet to that, access to the internet. And uh, to talk to the, my other fellow board members about what they have for internet access, whether it be a satellite, that, and we all know in heavy snowstorms and, and uh, rain and those kind of things, that doesn't work very well. And some of them with lower, you know, with lower quality uh, access difference it makes and I'm so proud every time to say <laughs> I don't have that problem guys I've got it right to my doorstep it's really important for us to make sure that we push that uh, it opens up so many doors for us in the, in the world of agriculture uh, we I like I like to think that it's uh, my dad talks about in the 1950s when REA came and they got electricity to the farm this is much the same if not more important to get the electricity. The other thing, and I, I know I'm going to step on our next group of panelists uh, uh, that goes here a little bit, but the, the commerce that it opens up and the, uh, the opportunity that opens up for our, our rural communities. My first job, uh, prior to being a farmer, uh, I was an extension agent. And my first job was in western Kansas and Wallace County. That's as western Kansas as you can get. It's in mountain time. Uh, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it. <laughs> now that was, I was told that from another person. So. The only chance they have for economic development comes with, high, with, with fiber, with high-speed internet, and the ability to telecommute. Uh, it's, it's no secret that the farm economy's not been good for the last year or so. And the only way many of us can stay on the farm is to have off-farm income be a spouse or, or we have a part-time job and the ability to telecommute the ability to, to to do that also adds to that and add it gives us the ability to come back to the farm it gives the ability to some of for some of our kids we talked about the outward migration it gives them the ability to bring some of those kids back into our rural communities bring some of that talent back into our rural communities let them bring their kids back and, and raise them in our, in our good uh, school districts like Valley Heights and like Rock Creek. So it's really exciting uh, to be able to uh, offer, you know, you have the ability to do anything you can in one of our larger cities and still have the, the rural lifestyle. As far as farming, who knows what it's gonna bring, I, I don't know. Uh, I couldn't have, ten, 10 years ago, five years ago, I couldn't have foresaw what we're, what we're doing today. So uh, we need to make sure that we keep working to, to, to bring the growth to the fiber, high speed and the fiber out to all the, the 
world producers. And uh, like I said, I, I cannot say enough good things about Blue Valley. You know, we've got a local company that we can talk to. I, I know I know the technicians. <laughs> they probably they probably draw straws as we get to talk to them. Because <laughs> uh, I can screw up about anything. But it does mean a lot to have that here. It means, and, and I'm so proud to have the technology that we have to our farm, uh, and it does mean a lot uh, in terms of what we can do as an ag producer. So, uh, now we'll, we'll shift over to uh, Mr. Edwards, who actually knows how to use the technology. So <laughs> During my job interview, one of the questions I was asked was, when was the time that you and your boss ever disagreed? There was a time not that long ago, just last year, that me and my boss were disagreeing about how we wanted to keep our records, either on an iPad or on the computer. I wanted to do it on the iPad because I know iCloud was able to back up my information that I would put on there. And he wanted to do it on the computer because he was a little bit older and knew how to use the computer. <laughs> My boss is 64 years old, and so he wanted to do it on the computer, but with my information on the technology and on the iPad, I was able to keep the records on the iPad, and later that day, we actually had an issue with the computer, and it crashed later. So with my iPad, we were able to save the records and save that operation for that day. Technology is just not just impacting the whole world with people in the city and everything, but it's also in agriculture, and I know that for sure because without technology like GPS, we wouldn't be able to farm all the land we can right now. Because back in older times, we were not able to farm up so close to roads or up so close to trees and everything. But with technology now, we can do that. And that's very important for moving on and with our growing population in 2050 of getting to 9.6 billion people. We're gonna to have to feed the world and technology is gonna be a big part on that. I really like using technology in farming because it also helps me with day-to-day -day operations with checking cattle, checking cattle, and because sometimes on my phone, I, when we're calving right now, I like to keep my records on my phone so I know what cows or heifers have had calves that day, and later on in the week, we can go back and we can check it in our book that we keep in our trucks and it's just very important in that aspect but also some of the apps on the iPad that I've been using is like a DTN app we have a DTN machine in our uh, shop that we have at the farm and I like to use that a lot and so I got it on the iPad and I don't we don't have to rely on it so much because we have the high speed internet that we have and it's very nice to have it because it would not be able to if we didn't have a high speed internet, our day to day operations would actually slow down a little bit and it would hurt the farm business because then we wouldn't be able to produce our crops as fast, be able to know the prices that our crops are going for and what cattle is going for. Also, I'm using Climate View app right now, it's a field app, and just like the soil map, and it's one of that, and I was introduced to that by my brother in law who works down at Great Bend at the co op down there. And he showed me that app and I really, I started using it just a couple days ago and I'm getting into using it a lot more and checking our fields and everything. And it's very important just going on throughout our lifetime that technology is just gonna keep impacting everything in our world and especially agriculture. Now I'll hand it over to my ag teacher, Mr. Obermeyer. As Anthony kind of talked about the job interview, uh, we had the job interview career development event here uh, middle of last week, and he was one of the people that was being interviewed for that. And uh, so kind of off that, we got an email saying uh, from Jay Ackerman here at Blue Valley saying, can you come present? And uh, so we're, we're glad to be here. Um, I kind of got put on the spot here a few minutes ago by Jay to come up here and talk to you guys. But uh, I am the Ag Ed Advisor and uh, instructor down at Valley Heights. Um, just kind of like building off some of the things that Glenn said um, about off farm income. Um, I have a full time job as an ag ed instructor, but I've also got that full time job when I come home from school, just like Glenn um, has in the past and, and still does, of, of being on the family farm. 
Um, so I have the unique opportunity to not only utilize a lot of these technologies, utilize um, the effects of high-speed internet, uh, utilize the new things that are coming out, but I'm also able to take those, um, implement them in the classroom. And uh, not only are we relying on you know, the high-speed technology for these farmers here um, and in our agriculture community, uh, we're also needing it for our rural schools uh, where I'm able to have the same technology and utilize the same technology that I'm using on the farm, that I am um, using in the classroom and teaching these students to utilize within the future. Uh, we've, at our high school, we're a one-to-one -one iPad initiative, um, so we can have those uh, technologies, those apps. Um, I can pull up just about anything I need to teach it in the classroom, but I also have the ability to take it home and, and use it on the family farm, where I can um, gain the knowledge and, and the need for uh, those tools and validate them that if, if they're working for us, you know, I, I need to be teaching them to the students as well. And uh, then they're able to take that, that home with them. Um, and you know, just the big thing about reliability. Uh, farmers need reliability. You know, no matter where they're at in their their communities, we need to have that uh, technology there uh, so that they can use the tools that they have in front of them. Uh, because we're not going to feed everybody in this country uh, if we don't have the tools to continue to improve. So uh, I thank you for the opportunity to let us come today. And uh, any questions, we're happy. Yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. And I tell you what, if we have all of our agriculture representatives, uh, such as Mr. Uh, Anthony here in the middle, uh, as there's a future agriculture folks, I think we're going to be in pretty good shape. So we appreciate that. Uh, one thing I did want to mention. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we get to some questions, I want to remember, I remember Glenn, we had about three or four, what, four or five years ago. Yeah, probably longer now. Yeah. When you get to be older like that, I mean, you know, you might. Um, Fox Business came out and did a, did a uh, news piece on uh, agriculture, or broadband and agriculture, right? They broadcast for the entire day for my farm. Uh, every hour they have a cut in. Um, you want to attract some attention from your neighbors, have a satellite truck. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was uh, a really interesting uh, opportunity to uh, uh, interact with them but to be able to have that uh, platform and be able to talk about that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> she told me to. I spent most of my uh, grade school career in the hallway because of this voice. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was, uh, we, we had the opportunity uh, every hour, like I said, to, to uh, talk, uh, to, to do something on air they cut out to us. Uh, and we talked to them. And, and, and it was really interesting to sit with the, the technicians in and the satellite truck. It was a shock that we didn't have some of the things that, that they did at the time. Uh, it's improved every single day. That was before I had fiber out to my house. Uh, and, uh, so, yeah, we've, we've had some, some great opportunities to discuss this. But I remember when we were, we, we, I came down there to represent Blue Valley, and uh, the first thing I remember is they, the, the crew that came in came in from Los Angeles. If I remember right, it was about this time of year. Yeah. This guy came and he did the thing. They flew into Kansas City and it was, it was, it was cold. He, he just had a little light jacket and, and it, it, was a, it was a joke on their part. But anyways, he was scrambling trying to find warm clothes and he couldn't stay warm enough. But I remember going out there and pointing to it on the ground and saying, okay, you could actually see where our fiber had been laid. And we just laid it just a year or two ahead, ahead of that. But anyways, it was, a, it was an amazing picture because we were up on top of this hill. I said, here's where the fiber is. And he asked, where does it go? I said, it goes straight west. And it kind of panned up there and looked straight west. You couldn't see a house. You know, we, we were running fiber out there and, and I don't know what our numbers are uh, per, per mile. Uh, 3.2 customers per mile. And that's including the big city of Wheaton. <laughs> and uh, Westmoreland and all of us, but uh, but three point whatever customers per mile, and it was pretty impressive. You could you look down there, and you could probably look at least three or four miles, and you couldn't see a house, but you could see where the fiber was going. I said, if you compare that to laying fiber down Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and 
how many customers are you getting in, in, in Chicago? You compare that to what we're out here. And you think we're equal, and we need to work on that. But like I said, we, we, I think with our agriculture, the future of agriculture is in pretty good hands with our instructors and, and uh, students we have here. So uh, we do have some time for some questions. And this will be a great opportunity. You've got a great panel here to ask some questions. I know Glenn's not bashful, so he, he, he'll talk about anything. But do we have any questions here from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that I have access to from anywhere. Uh, 
Um, I don't have to take that, write it down, and then go back to the house and put it in there again, or, or something along those lines. Um, as far as our farming side of things, you know, the, the amount of technology in our equipment uh, allows us the ability to um, have constant yield monitoring in our combines. We can pull that information out, put it in the computer when we get home, or some of them are, are transferring them directly to those systems. Um, and like I said, we can limit our, or um, increase our inputs depending on certain parts of the field or certain um, areas or farms that may need more attention. We can see that in real time and uh, not have to do a lot of the extra uh, things that uh, we do at one place here and then you have to go back and do it someplace else again. Where do you get the majority of your resources uh, for new technology or how to use different technology? Is it primarily word of mouth? Are there forums? Are there magazines? I mean, what, where do you find out about the newest, greatest thing, what's out there? Other than somebody coming and selling you and saying, hey, buy my product. What are, where, where do you find that information at? Um, for us, a lot of it's word of mouth. You know, you, you talk to the neighbor down the road what they're using. Um, you know, during the winter, the farmers are going to for trade shows and, and seeing how things work. Um, but I would say a lot of it's word of mouth, you know, and, and whether it's Facebook and, you know, other internet-based things that, that we do, the forums that we do visit, you know, I'm a, a part of Star Love, and, you know, if there's something I like or see that, that might interest me, I'm going to probably look into it, and then, you know, somebody down the road, probably somewhere close, has had some experience with it, and that's um, kind of the way I would go about it. I'm the same with him. I get it a lot from word of mouth, and I also look at a lot of magazines, agricultural magazines that have the technology in them, just like drones. That's something that one of my farms that I work on is actually looking at getting, so when we're checking cattle sometimes, we don't actually have to go all the way out into the pasture and check. We can get to a certain area, put our drone out, and just go out and use it. And I get it from a lot from magazines because I love to read the magazines on agriculture and everything. Now my first my first thought was yes, meter with your question. Yeah. It varies. Um, you know, this is the this is the farm show time of the year and obviously you see a lot of things in the farm show. I think it takes me two or three times seeing something to, to, to adopt it. That I have to see it at the farm show, I have to hear it from my neighbors, I have to see it in the, in the print. And so, yeah, it, it, it comes from various forms. Uh, probably the most powerful was the guy next door, but, but uh, also somebody's got to be the first one to adopt it. So, uh, whether it's the farm show or, or RFD TV or, or you know various various places. I don't know if anybody caught that or not, but Anthony said something that just really boggled my mind. He said he read something in a magazine. <laughs> I thought magazines were online. Yeah. Oh, it was an online magazine. Okay, no, no. You know, it, but it is amazing that the, the technology, like I said, there's so many things online. That's, you know, I like to go online and I, I can get all my news fixes in about five minutes and just read here and there and stuff. But, uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, uh, opportunities out there to, uh, to uh, learn a lot of things. So we have more time for one more question. I'm really excited about it. I know Mr. Grassman, you, you, you talk about the, the drones and stuff, and then you're talking about the check your cattle and stuff. Like, are, are, the, are the drones all tied? Will they be, are they, and, and will they be tied to GPS in the future? This is Mr. Grassman from down, down the road a little ways. Um, well, the drones right now, they're pretty localized to just the out over the internet, it's the GPS is built into the drum, so you can program it into grid pattern and field and just push button on the top, take pictures throughout the field. It's all geolocated, so you can pull that data back and look at it on your computer. Um, one big thing, one of the big reasons we bought our drum is um, like we do our yield mapping on our computer. We know areas of the field that are kind of below average. So the goal of the drone for me is to go out and in the middle of the seasonal 
fly to those areas and zoom in real close and take pictures of them, the plants, and uh, try and figure out if there's something I can identify to you know, say it's short on a nutrient, I can, in the future, I can go back and fix that. And uh, that's one of the big things which we're growing. I might add a little on the, as far as the internet, um, one of the big things for me, besides the ability to, to use a lot of the technology, big thing for me on the internet is the ability to continue learning. Like, um, I graduated from college five years ago, and the amount of information that I've learned since then is, is just, I mean, it's, you're not limited to what you already know. You, I mean, YouTube is huge. I, that's one thing that, I mean, if I don't know something right away, I'll Google it, YouTube it. I mean, and that, I've learned a lot. Um, the future of farming is, it's not gonna look anything like it looks today. And, uh, Five years ago, we were dealing with megabytes of data. Today, it's gigabytes, and tomorrow, it's going to be terabytes. So, I mean, it's it's changing fast. So. All right, thank you. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I think chain farming has changed quite a bit already. Because I remember when I was of age and don't know enough about working on the farm. You know, it sounds like the drones and the all the roundup ready soybeans and everything is taking all the fun out of farming. I remember going pulling weeds out of the beans. And, and uh, we didn't have drones to go check and see where the feet was. The problem was you walked out through it and found it. So, um, with that, I think we'll uh, give our panel a round of applause here and thank you all for coming out. <laughs> was the director of Republic County Economic Development from 2003 to 2004, and starting in 2010, her company again handles economic development for the county. From this relationship stems more community development work for Jill County and a stint in development for Clyde, Kansas. And Emma Jean Harris is as manager of economics and operations. Emma Jean over, am I saying that right? I'm a Jean. I am so sorry. I apologize. So let's do this again. As manager of economics and operations, I'm a Jean oversees the day to day workshops of Network for Kansas statewide funding program. I'm a Jean joined Network Kansas in December 2013 after working in compliance for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, KDHE. I'm a Jean especially appreciates the opportunity to work with an organization whose resources not only help Kansas businesses and entrepreneurs, but also improves the quality of life in Kansas. I'm a Jean is a lifelong Kansan, hailing from Ottawa, and now calling Lawrence home, where she also earned a BS in Environmental Studies from the University of Kansas. So let's welcome to Jenny and I'm a Jean. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Patty Clark and Blue Valley for inviting us to come speak. Um, I'm Jenny Russell. I am actually originally, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Patty said, just talk from the cup. So we didn't present anything. Hopefully it was go well. Um, I'm from Glen Elmer, Kansas, which is kind of interesting because John Deacon is here. And he's from Glenelg, Kansas, and Brent Cunningham was supposed to be here, and he's from Glenelg, Kansas, so shout out to Glenelg, Kansas, population 400. We are representing today. And now I live in Portland, Kansas. My husband's originally from Portland, Kansas, and its population is 297 people. So I am proud to say I am the first and probably only advertising agency in Glenelg, and in Portland, Kansas, so what we're doing great there, too. Um, I started, but when growing up, my dad's a farmer, um, and my mom's a science teacher, high school science teacher, and she always asked me, when she you want to move back? What am I gonna do if I move back to Florida, Kansas? Because I, you know, I had a degree, I didn't want to work at the grocery store, not that there's anything wrong with that, I didn't really have any ag background, you can ask my dad, I'm a terrible farm daughter. I'm a much better farm wife, my husband actually farms as well, he's a commodity broker, but uh, she asked me that, and I, I I mean, yeah, I love being in a rural area, but what was I going to do? Um, after I worked in economic development for Republic County, I got the opportunity to go work for Brush Art in Downs, Kansas. And that was one of the things that revolutionized my view on rural. 
Um, they are an amazing company. They compete nationwide and worldwide for business. They compete against New York City, they compete against LA very successfully. They actually have an advantage of being in Dallas, Kansas. They um, can do everything from the internet, through the internet and phone, um, and then they don't have the overhead that you would in a big city. So they're able to operate very well out of Downs, Kansas, and they just, like I said, it revolutionized the way I saw rural and what you can actually do in rural. Um, rural doesn't have to be less educated. Rural doesn't have to be just ag. I mean, there's lots of opportunities out here that we can accomplish, and uh, and it, you know we can be educated and live here. It doesn't it doesn't mean we can't. Um, they. Uh, the other thing that revolutionized my, revolutionized my view of rural was Marcy Penner with the Kansas St. Louis Foundation. And um, some of you know her. She is just amazing. And um, when I was doing my senior thesis in college, I did it on uh, economic development for Glen Elder, Kansas. That's what I did it on. And uh, somebody said, call Marcy Penner. She'll have stuff on Glen Elder, Kansas. So I was like, she will not have anything on Glen Elder, Kansas. There's nothing in Glen Elder, Kansas. She sent me all kinds of stuff. I was just like, huh something here. And um, then I saw her a couple years later. She knew exactly who I was. I hadn't seen her for a couple years later after that. She knew exactly who I was. She's just really an amazing person. Um, so after I worked for Brush Art, my husband wanted to move back and help his dad on the farm. He, but his dad was getting older. So we moved to Cortland and uh, we actually shared a building with Next Tech um, in Cortland. And when they built the building for Next Tech, they built it a little bit more, more wide for us. Um, so we share a building with them, and uh, that's been a, amazing. We got fiber and premise, uh, I think like five years ago, I see Mindy out there, she probably knows better than me on this, but um, I've, I have friends in Kansas City now that are so excited for Google, Google Fiber to come in, I'm like, I've had that for five years, you know? So, uh, first, you know, something we're actually first with, it's just so, we're so blessed, and I think I take that advantage, or I take, that for granted that we have that, but I know there was a lot of behind the scenes things like this, talking about this years ago. And it's really a blessing that, like I said, I'm sure I take for granted when I can just turn on my computer and get things quickly and do what I need to do. Um, but my company is a marketing company. Um, people think, why are you a community development? That's not marketing. And it is marketing, if you think about it. It's marketing for communities. So we do all the, the websites, the graphic design, all of that stuff. Um, but we do a lot of internet marketing, social media marketing, uh, search engine optimization. We Google a lot of stuff. I like that comment. We, we Google too. We Google lots of things. But um, so we do all that. And then we have a community development arm, which we do Republic County Economic Development. I had some experience with them before, so they hired my company on. I worked with Luke Mahan. Um, he, uh, he basically handles a lot of Republic County, and now I handle Jewel County Community Development. So we help both of those counties. Um, something that I noticed, I read something from Forbes the other day. It said 40% of the workforce population will be millennials by the year 2020. And one of the things that millennials really value is a work-life balance. Um, and my company works kind of like this. Um, as long as you're getting what you need to get done, you can do that from the office. If you have to do that from home at night, if you've been somewhere, you can do that. Um, for instance, Luke coaches junior high basketball. He can go do that as long as he gets stuff done for our clients the rest of the week. And that might be a might be back coming back to the office at eight o'clock after he gets back to practice or a game or something like that. Or it might be sometimes I work Saturday mornings. I mean, yes, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, <laughs> I can be at home, I can be on my phone. Um, I, I pretty much work all the time, but I, I work on my own terms, and I think that's what that means. Um, and then, let's see. Um, one of the things Marcy, and well, I talked about Marcy Penny, Penner earlier, and this is something that we're really preaching over Republic County and Jewel County, um, is you can be ruled by choice. I think some people think we're, you get stuck, that's kind of how you get here. You kind of get stuck, your dad was a farmer, you come and you get stuck. And we're changing that. Um, we're trying to change that. We think that we're rural by choice. We want to be here. We're here on purpose. <laughs> we actually have a degree and we came back on purpose. What a, what a, what a concept. But um, that's new for some reason out here. It's, it's new. And the ability to come out here and tell commute and uh, 
work remotely. I think we see that as a trend and we hope that trend is going to increase, and I think it will. Um, people, I've seen people already that have moved back that maybe still work for a company in Kansas City, but they live in Portland or they live somewhere small and rural. Um, and they can do that because they have fiber to premise, high-speed internet, and all those things, like I said, I'm sure that you guys have worked very hard on, but I take for granted every day. Um, and then I work with clients um, across the nation, and I have some, have some international clients. They have no clue that I'm sitting in an office in Portland, Kansas, or maybe I'm sitting on my sofa in my living room. Um, but and as long as I give them the results that they're looking for, they really don't ask that, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, you can, you can, like I said, revolutionizing the way you look at rule. And I don't have to deal with the traffic. I mean, I think people think, oh, you live so far out there. It's a lot like you can't drive places, you know? Um, I, I, it's kind of a reverse commute. Even in Kansas City, you're gonna have sometimes an hour drive to things. You think, oh, it's just over there in Kansas City. It took you a whole hour to get there. Well, we can be in Salina by then. We can be in Manhattan by then. I mean, we can drive places. It's, I don't know. I, it's so funny. It's like, do you have plumbing and running water? Yes, yes, we do. We do. Um, but uh, let's see, a diversification. I talked about community development being very odd to some people that a marketing company would do community development. But we're very diverse and we're diverse for a purpose. Um, that way we don't, you know, we don't have all of our eggs in one basket when an industry goes is low for a while. And I think the same thing about community. Um, we are very ad focused out here. We're very proud of that. But uh, I think the more diversification of businesses that we have, the better. And I think internet is going to be the key to that. Um, not only, and I think, I mean, Jean's gonna touch a little bit on this, so I don't wanna hit too far on it, but not only like how our traditional models work for uh, our shops and our stores, um, but home-based businesses, Etsy, those type of things are very, gonna be very, can be and already have been revolutionary uh, to living out here. Um, and the other thing I wanted to touch on was the, the more we get, especially Kansas, and even the nation, the more urban that we get, the better job rural is going to have to be doing of educating others. Um, Peterson Farm Brothers do a very good job of this right now. Um, they actually talk about what they're doing. They understand, not everybody understands that. Like I said, I was a farm girl, and I still don't know if I understood that that well. And I do a lot better now, um, but still there's so much to learn, and farmers know this as we just heard. I mean, even farmers, it's a hard time keeping up. It's, um, and there's a, uh, there's a learning curve, and that's kind of what we pride ourselves in. Um, we try to um, introduce the trends into rural and then try to help people understand them better. Uh, we see that a lot, that uh, the one generation is kind of used to how they're doing it, and they don't really know how to move on or go forward, I guess. And so we try to help him do that. I see that a lot with my dad. He can fix an engine. I mean, he can teach him how stuff how to do that. But he didn't want to touch a computer. He's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I might break it. I want to turn it off. And I'm like, Dad, you can do this. You can do all of these other things. You can do this. Um, so he, he got himself an email address. It's, it's, it's amazing. He has an email address. I try to remember to email him every once in a while because I'm sure nobody else does. But anyhow. Um, but that's kind of what I had written down. Um, there's lots of jobs besides that that we can diversify this economy with. Graphic designers, photographers, uh, Etsy, uh, people you know produce things and put them out on Etsy. Amazon. Uh, I saw something with Amazon was like oh, 40 for 40 percent of Black Friday sales this year, or something like that. Anybody can list on Amazon. Anybody out here can list on Amazon. Any store out here can use Amazon for selling. So there's lots and lots of opportunities, and like I said, I'm sure it's all brought about by the work that you guys have done in these past sessions, in these past years, um, looking at these things before they need to be looked at and putting these things into place. So we're out here, and we're proud of it, and we're out here partly because of um, digital and rural and internet and fiber premise, things that are all been such a blessing to what I do now. So thank you, and I'm gonna let Anna Jean talk a little bit about what she does, and we work with her a little bit on e-community stuff through Rural, uh, Republic County Economic Development is in an e-community right now. So we get to see her and Eric Peterson quite a bit, and they do a great job, so I know you'll be interested to hear what she says. So uh, Network 
Kansas was um, formed in 2004, we were actually established um, in, in legislature, in a statute, so, but we're a nonprofit, so we're like a little quasi-government organization within the state. And I like to say that means we get to have a little more fun, but, you know, I don't know. I can anyway. <laughs> so the, the main, one of the main purposes of Network Kansas is basically centralizing all the different resources for small businesses um, across the entire state of Kansas. So any kind of nonprofit or public resource um, that can help a business or is a part of creating a business, we're bringing that all together in one hub. Um, so if someone were to contact us, we can try to send that business owner or potential business owner out to where they need to go. It's trying to make it easier for them to find the resources they need. Um, the other function we have, which is kind of my primary job, is we have some funding programs, a couple different loan programs and an investment program um, to help fund the businesses in Kansas, right? Um, and so that's my primary job is for those statewide uh, programs. And then, as Jen mentioned, we also have our e-communities program, which is entrepreneurship communities. And it's kind of taking those two functions of resources and funding and putting it at that really local uh, community level, which is awesome. I mean, that's why you guys are all here. It's this, this community, um, making connections, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and best practices sharing. It's really important. And me alone in Topeka, I can't do that for the whole state. So if we can find other leaders in the communities to be doing that in their area, we can kind of extend and have greater reach on uh, our, our goals. So they're just, they're really cool. I don't work with them as much as some of our other staff, but I just think it's such cool little things. Um, so for me personally, as I said, I am from Ottawa, Kansas, so I'm from the eastern side of the state. Um, but I am jealous of the fiber. I don't have fiber. Uh, I live 10 miles south west of Lawrence, and we even even we are like, where are we? What is the best way to get internet? Like, we're outside of the city limits, so we can't get things that are as fast. Right now, I'm on an AT&T hotspot, <laughs> uh, so I have a data cap. Now, this doesn't affect me in terms of how it does you with farming. I, I, I'm more concerned about how I'm going to, you know, marathon my Netflix uh, shows. So it's a different purpose, but yeah, it's still an issue. There's still demand there, right? <laughs> really love someone solve that problem for me. So, um, but for small businesses, for more important things than getting your Netflix show then, um, is, as Glenn mentioned, you know, there's having access to not just internet, quality internet, competitive high speed internet, opens up the opportunity for commerce. Um, in fact, we had, as an example, uh, a business, I believe it's in Marysville, it's not, it's another city that starts with an M, but I think it's Marysville, and she has a storefront, um, so she's on Main Street, but most of her business comes from internet sales. This is what keeps her open and keeps her competitive. She sells a bunch of flags to people on the East Coast. That's, that's primarily where her income comes from. So, you know, it, it, so this is another way for businesses to stay competitive and even to stay open. Like I said, she has a storefront, but that's not the main reason that she's staying open. It's because she's mailing her products, you know, across the country. Selling them nationwide, um, and then also we have there is a business we help that we actually put through. Um, what we have it's called our economic gardening program, um, which is a program that helps. Uh, we call them second stage businesses, so they're usually um, more. Uh, it's easier to think of them as usually like smaller manufacturers. It's it's more than that, but that's an easy way to explain it. Um, it kind of helps them have more efficiencies like with the search engine optimization, where they can reach new markets, should they be looking at new markets and things like that. Um, so one of our economic gardening clients, they have like security cameras or security systems that they do. They're based out of, I think it's Elwood, Kansas. It's a tiny little town. That access to their internet allows them to find more clients, communicate with their clients, um, produce the software that I think they make along with their actual, like the actual cameras and stuff that they sell. So having that access makes a difference. I mean, they maybe wouldn't be able to stay based in that little town 
if it wasn't there. Um, so, I mean, it definitely is an important issue, right, for rural to stay competitive. Um, and let's see, the gentleman over here made a point. I really like this. You said the internet allows you the ability to continue learning. That, that's awesome. That just, I really love that. That's so important. Yeah, Network Kansas, yeah, sure, we're here to help connect you to resources. You know what's also really good? Google, you can Google anything, you know? Like, going on and saying, hey, you know, what are the top apps for farming? Let me go Google that. What are the best ways to do this? It keeps the ability to learn, you know, learn new things, gain more knowledge, or find out where you can. I really like that. Um, so, I think just kind of from what I've been hearing today, uh, and what I think, I hear this phrase a lot, and I'm not really sure where, <laughs> but they say, think globally and act global locally. And that's what you're talking about. You're talking about feeding, you know, you're farming, you got to feed the nation, you're feeding the world, right? You got to think globally. How can we reach, um, in terms of like that Main Street business, how can she reach outside of her local market? help stay profitable? How do we think locally, act locally so we can actually do that? So we can actually reach those goals and have the capacity um, to take those actions. So that's what I got. Do you have anything else? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but there are plenty of time for questions here. So uh, I had a couple things right off the bat. First, uh, Jenny, I believe you said something. I'm going to take it as a compliment. You take your broadband for granted. You know, I, I think that should be a feather in the cap, and with all due respect to you, Jenny, uh, that's what we're out here for in rural, you know, rural America, rural Kansas, is trying to make the best, and we haven't said this yet this morning, but quality of life. I think that's what's really undermining why we're all here today, whether it be the, the telecommunications, the agriculture, the leadership, you know what I'm saying, it's all Kansas. Uh, it's quality of life, that's why we're all here. That's why you do what you do in, in uh, is it Downs or Copper Center, yeah. Portland, Portland, yeah. Portland, and then, uh, and then the things you do on a state level. One of my questions to you, I Gene, is, is that state funding, is that is all state funded? Uh, is your, your grants and everything like that, is that all state money or federal? Or combination there. Um, so it's a, it's a combination. Um, we have a tax credit that helps us raise funds, and then um, some of our programs were established through federal funding that a program we apply for. So it's a combination. All right. Any questions out there? <coughs> yes. Okay. One of the things we work for, and I think. Um, one of the things I like about being in rural Kansas is that I can make a huge difference. Um, I could probably get a great job in a big city somewhere, but the things I do here, and especially through community development and economic development, I feel can make a huge difference. Um, I think I appreciate this format because um, I think you're validating that rule is important. And that's something that we don't feel a lot out here is that we're that important. And we get a lot of, um, I think we feel like we get ignored a lot of things. Um, and I think it's just getting it worse and worse. Like I said, as people migrate from rural um, and if people don't understand it, it's gonna get harder and harder to, to translate that. But one of the things I wanted to point out is uh, we know that we're not on maybe be a 30,000 person county like we were back in 1917 or whatever. I mean, and people dwell on that too much. Uh, I think I get a lot of people that say, you know, what was me, we don't have as many people. Well, you know what? Maybe we're never gonna get back to 30,000, but we can be a dang good 4,000 person county. Or, you know, it doesn't mean we can't grow. It doesn't mean there are not opportunities out here. Um, and I think we see, you know, we may not land this huge manufacturing plant with 800 jobs, it's gonna save our community, but we can grow locally. We can grow local, local talent. Um, I love these guys out here from the high school. So important to listen to them. Um, I, I always say we need to keep getting interns so that they can come in and teach us, you know, and teach us what they know as they come up just by virtue of age. They have such a such a different insight and they're very important um, to what we do. And I think that um, not not all of us recognize that, some of us may be intimidated by that, but that's something we try to really embrace. Um, 
not only from my company, but through economic development, um, just recognizing that talent there and recognizing the, the valuable input that they have um, to everything that we do. So, that's the point. The point I picked up on there is, is, is it's quality, not quantity of people. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's nice to have the quality of folks that, that are they're choosing to live cruel and, and that kind of thing. So we really appreciate that. Okay. Yes. You're both in economic development, rural development, rural, that's in your backgrounds and in your blood. It's clear from what you've said. Imagine yourself in just a second in a room full of urban counterparts. What three things... Can they close their eyes? Yeah, you know. imagine. What three things would you tell your urban counterparts to urge them to think about moving to a rural area. That would be them. That's a hard one. What three things would we tell people in an urban area why they should value or consider rural? Um, I think it's just the fact that um, just because we're rural doesn't just means we value things a little bit differently. Maybe some other things over, you know, maybe we don't have to have a restaurant in every corner, but we value that relationship we have with our grandma or uh, value the impact we can have on our community. So it's not that we're, um, I don't know, it's not that, I don't know. It's not that we're hitching the sticks that don't know anything. It's that we we um, we just value something differently, and we understand them too. Um, I understand why you want to live urban. I mean, I understand that, but um, there's also so many great things about living rural, and uh, I think that's that's one thing. Um, just a commonality. I think there's a true divide of people that um, uh, I don't know. I've heard lots of things. Oh, you live west of Manhattan. You live in western Kansas. What? I mean, just that, just that, that whole, if you get past I-130, or I-3135, you're really, really in the sticks. <laughs> but, I mean, and then I've got friends who live in Garden City, and I understand, because I go, oh, Garden City is a long ways out there. But, you know, once you get there, it's amazing. They got great stuff in Garden City. So, I mean, just things like that. I think that'd be one out of three. I don't know if I got three. And do you have another two? <laughs> I can try. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, um, and I think this kind of goes along with what you're talking about too, but like sense of community. Like I said, I really like our e-community programs. They're so neat, because um, especially the ones that just like really rock at it, the ones that just really get it, they get it done because they're working together for the same cause. And I don't know, it's just kind of unique. Um, sometimes in the urban areas, it's not that they don't want to improve their own communities. They do. I mean, they have, we're pretty much all the same. <laughs> we really are. We have a lot of the same kind of goals. It's just, it's just di different context. And um, the community is just the way they can kind of come together and get things done. It's, it's just really neat. It doesn't get as lost in the noise that you can in some of the cities. Um, and I really like that. And then I think just from a personal reason for me, uh, the space. I, I, we finally got five acres. I couldn't be happier. I love it. Uh, you know, the, the sunsets, the open fields. It's like, geez, you can just kind of breathe out here. Um, but, you know, if they don't like that, well, then they probably shouldn't be out there anyway, so. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things I think of too is that um, we try to think regionally now. Um, so, we try not to be so competitive, so if, um, if Concordia is stronger, then and that's not in our county. That's okay, it's close enough for people to work there. So if Concordia is stronger, we're stronger. And I kind of think of the same thing with uh, maybe a statewide view. Uh, you know, if Eastern Kansas is stronger, hopefully then that will translate to Western Kansas being stronger, Central Kansas being stronger. And the same thing I would like to convey, if Western Kansas is stronger, Eastern Kansas is stronger than the state strong. Um, and I think that we kind of get lost in that. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I, it, you know, if you get more, you know, more affordable food at your grocery stores, and you don't, you know, that's good for you. Or you know, if if we can pay more of our own stuff out here and grow, that's better for Eastern Kansas too. So I think that's a good point. Um, we're all as a whole, and if one part's stronger, the other part's stronger. 
they can make a big up in that is a, a rising tide raises all ships. So you know, one one part's doing well, but that hopefully that'll just transfer to another part. I'm gonna get on my soapbox now. Bring <laughs> it out. Um, to answer Patty's question, uh, location, 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 best part about real estate. Um, but it's a high standard of living, low cost of living, um, and connection. And you kind of touched on the connection. Um, and one of the things you talked about with economic development is every business knows you do what you do best. Play to your strengths. Kansas, Kansas' is strength is connection. You know, I moved back to Kansas from Pittsburgh, PA, two years ago, and this is a ritual around problem to serve the rural telcos. And the first two or three rural telcos I went out to, somebody goes, oh, you're originally from Cheney. Well, my brother-in-law teaches there and taught my little brother, or this or this or this. There's connections everywhere you go in Kansas. And so when you look at our strength as a state, what we have to offer businesses is that small business connection. Somebody that can't, doesn't have the big logistics, somebody that doesn't have the accounting or the legal or all the different things that a, a large business has, but they can come into our rural communities and we support each other. We look each other up and we make each other successful. And that's what Kansas has to offer our communities, businesses coming in and businesses that are growing here, is that ability to support each other and connect with each other. You know, when you look at what happens in, in, in towns and communities that have natural disasters, transfer, it wasn't at and that's in their exchange that went in there and helped them out. It was Howland Telephone Company that went over there. That, that's not their, even their service area. But it's the communities around them that say, you know what, we're going to pick up other Kansans. And I think that's one of the things that we have best to offer. And I think rural communities have that. Because you know your neighbor. When I lived in Pittsburgh, PA, I didn't know my neighbors. When I lived in Boston, I didn't know my neighbors. When I, knew, when I lived in Alaska, I knew everybody in town. <laughs> but it's the same way in Kansas. Rural communities have that ability to connect with each other. And it's not that there aren't connections in big communities, but there's just so many people. You you can't connect, you can't stop and talk to people because there's too many people to stop and talk to anybody. Um, and I think that's one of the things that Kansas offers. But when you're looking at the economic development and what we have to do is all of the people in this room is we have to get out there and spread that message. You heard what they're talking about with our movement. The number one way that they find out about stuff is word of mouth. Are we sharing the word of mouth about what's going on in rural Kansas? I grew up here in Cheney, Kansas, in the AT&T Exchange. I didn't know that half of this stuff existed growing up in Kansas. You know, my parents are still in Pixie at 786 and they paid $65 a month. And then I come to territories like Blue Valley or Rainbow or, you know, Mutual, and I hear their customers complain about, you know, 25 meg for 50 bucks. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> you know, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, and Google got all the press in, in, in Kansas City. It was the first gigabit community where Next Tech, you know, did it years before that. And Mutual was the first fiber to the entire exchange in Kansas and one of our first smart rural communities. We have a lot to brag on, and we don't do it. We don't let people know what we have to offer in Kansas. We don't let them know the business support that's out there, the network Kansas, the groups out there that are bringing them up. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to do better. It's not that we need to change what we're doing, it's we need to let these people know what all we're doing in Kansas. I'll put myself on the way now. <laughs> That was, that was fantastic. Good, good way to wrap this session up. So I think I have questions. <laughs> we don't have time, Jada. You have you told me to keep on schedule. Yeah. And I'm gonna keep on your schedule. We, we have twelve Oh we have twelve minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, ladies, I have a question for you. Um, from an economic development perspective. We talked a little bit about youth and, and having them come back after school. What can we do as a room full of innovative minds to encourage those youth to come back after education? I can't get to you fast enough. We think a lot about this uh, and what I do in Republic County and Jewel County. Um, we've done a lot with, I liked his point spot on, um, with communicating better. Um, I think like I touched on Peterson Farm Brothers, that's why they're so successful. They're actually communicating what we're doing and making it layman's terms. Um, and same thing with what we're, we're trying to do. We have a Facebook page we started and um, we have found that it's hard to communicate with our alumni in a new way. Um, you know, we used to ask the school for an alumni list and we'd send out a letter and all this stuff and it costs money. And we have a 
Facebook page. We were trying to do a good job of putting good quality stuff out, um, good educational stuff, positive things that maybe you don't hear everywhere. And we're trying to change the culture. We're trying not to only change the culture of our communities, but we're trying to change the culture of our alumni and how they think about where they grew up. And I think that's very important. Um, like I said, I have my two aha moments with Brush Art and with Marcy Penner. Um, more people need to have that aha moment about how wonderful it is in Kansas. And we do a terrible job in bragging ourselves up. Um, I think, and then, you know, I think the other thing is asking. Um, you ask a lot of people who have moved away, were you ever asked to come back? Most of them will probably tell you no. Um, so if you have somebody that you think has great promise, that really fits well in a rural area, even if you don't think they fit well, ask them to come back. And that's so simple, but um, you know, if somebody that they love, ask them to come back, they're highly gonna consider it. And they're gonna figure out a way to do it if it's possible. So those are my two pieces of advice. Do you have any that? Yeah. Um so what it makes me think of is um, one of the other things that Network Kansas does um, through our e-communities is we have what's called the Youth Entrepreneurship Challenge. And so basically what we're doing is encouraging the e-communities um, or those in the, in, in the area to hold entrepreneurship fairs. Or so like business plan competitions for the students. Um, usually it's like seven to 12, uh, a grade seven to 12. Um, teaching them about entrepreneurship, encouraging them to think of what kind of business could they have? How could they, you know, make their own business happen? Their own business, start their own business. And um, it's a way to think of, another way of thinking of um, economic development is instead of bringing people in, how can you grow your own, how can you have them in the community? And so maybe these students who feel like there's nothing here for them, where, where, do, where are they even gonna work? Say they even go to school and come back, where are they gonna come back and work? This is a way to say, hey, why don't you come back and start a business? And what's interesting is um, one of my coworkers, Simone Elder, was actually on the news talking about the e fair in Hoffman County. And they had a couple students on this little news piece too, and they, it was two young ladies, and they said something to, they thought their business should be something that the community needs. Okay, so these students aren't just starting to figure out what it takes to start a business, a business plan, the financials, you know, um, they're also starting to think, hey, well, if I'm gonna do this, and since they're there, they're thinking in terms usually of being in their community, what is the need? What is the demand? What would be something that's successful? So they're starting to think about how they can give back. Uh, that's really cool, you know? Um, and so I, I really like that piece of it. I think that's an important part. I was just gonna add that. I think people think we have no jobs here. In all reality, I think Last I looked, Republic County had like a 2.9, 2.5% unemployment rate. And traditionally, about 3% of your population is never looking for work. So we really have a 0% unemployment rate, which means we have tons of jobs. Um, but we just, rural Kansas, especially rural areas, don't advertise the same way Kansas City does. For instance, in Kansas City, if I wanted to get a job, I'd go on the internet, I'd go to Career Builder, I'd go to Monster, I'd go to those places and find a job. Super simple. We don't do that out here. A lot of more businesses say, so, I'm a Jean. Who do you know that might be good to work here? And she'll say, oh, my cousin Jane, that's wonderful. A great way to screen candidates, but a terrible way to bring people back. Nobody knows you have a job open. Um, so I encourage people to go ask. Um, if you have a resume and you think you fit well in a company, if they don't have a position open, go tell them you're there anyway. Because lots of times, they want to hire somebody, they just don't want to put it out there which is crazy, but again, how rural Kansas works and how rural Kansas gets stuck sometimes. <laughs> but, so we try to do that for our employers. We, that's part of the ways we use our Facebook and Twitter pages to put out jobs. Um, and we do try to help pre-screen candidates because that's what they're worried about sometimes. Yeah. 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 Maybe John and Jilda would be a good people since they represent us in the senator's office this too. But I think a real key should be that we use our public universities to basically teach our, our kids. Most of our Kansas kids are going there. But say to them, these are your communities that gave to you. You have a chance to check with them first for a job and give back to them. 
we could get the Board of Regents to say, this is something we are absolutely going to push in our public universities and make sure that gets out to every instructor and every instructor at some time in the year, maybe several times, points out that Kansas needs you back. We need your talents and encourages them, okay, these are the places to go to look for a job first in Kansas. We might have a whole lot better chance. I just want to have one thing. Uh, Jen mentioned that sometimes you just need to ask them to come back, right? Um, so one of our uh, e-communities in Humboldt, which is in southeast of Kansas, one thing they did um, one year, or at least one year, I think they continued doing it, for their grad senior graduating class, lined up on the stage for each one of the students, they had a mailbox that was painted in the colors of their school. And this was basically their invitation. Hey, go off, you know, if you're going to go to college, if you're go be somewhere else for a while that's fine but here's your mailbox there's always an open invitation to come back to Humboldt we want you back and I always just thought that was like one of the coolest things to do like I mean I don't know what I would have done with the mailbox at 18 but I would have thought it was pretty darn cool <laughs> to get one anyway so all right good enough or I found that out later uh, really because Feds in Kansas is actually classified by the Feds as frontier. Did you know that? A few of you know that. That there's rural, and then there's frontier. And but you know, I will say, uh, quite honestly, our school closed in 1973, uh, at Edson, which was a little disappointing. But um, because I was, I was on track to be salutatorian in my class, not valedictorian, but the second. When the uh, pastor moved and took his daughter with him, so I moved up a notch. <laughs> there were five of us in that class. And now you can get all kinds of academic scholarships if you're in the top one or two, you know. But we moved to Goodland, had a, had a great educational experience there, went to K State. Actually, was a livestock judge for a lot of time. And I know Glenn and Patty and some of did that as well. I've judged about every county fair. Hodgman County, somebody mentioned that. I was like, oh, Jeff Moore, you know. So I've seen rural Kansas nice, and I've seen rural Kansas not so nice. <laughs> All you have to do is give a couple white ribbons and showmanship. Yeah. You better have your car back in <laughs> if you get out. But uh, no, th uh, thank you uh, again for having me here. I'm, I'm going to run through a few slides uh, and then uh, uh, hopefully uh, spend some time questions. Uh, and just a little bit about our timeline. The Regents have been around for a long time. Uh, I always look at 1925 as really kind of the formal life starts. And they decided at that time they didn't want the legislature hiring and firing CEOs of the university. And so they put a little gap in there uh, of appointed uh, regents. You can see when Wichita State joined the system in 1964. A great year, uh, by the way. And then uh, Really the big change, part of the Constitution in 66, in 1999 was, was the big change for the Regents, in that our state said we're going to have one board that governs the universities, the six public universities, and coordinates Washburn, which is a public university, and coordinates all the community and technical colleges. And I may be a little biased, but I think it's the best model. It's an efficient model. Uh, it's a lower cost model, uh, and I think most Kansans would agree that, that it just makes a lot of sense. So we, again, we, I didn't mean this slide, I had my bio, but we govern the government universities, we hire the, the CEOs of the universities, we coordinate the public institutions and community technical colleges. We also do the GED programs, which are important. There's, there been, there's 170,000 Kansans working age that do not have and uh, to really, you know, this, all this technology we're talking about is a tool. If you're going to participate in today's economy, everybody can say, well, I knew a person that didn't have a high school diploma, and they make, you know, everybody's got an anecdote, but trust me, on average, that education matters. We regulate the private institutions as well uh, that come into our state. As you can see, we pretty well have the state covered. 
and uh, about 250,000 students in Cache County annually. So not a large system as you compare them to higher ed systems, but still one that can make an impact uh, and one that a system that does bring in uh, and develops a lot of talent, brings in talent, and also and it's an enterprise about a half a billion dollars a year has tremendous research that helps our Kansas companies uh, really be competitive. We have a strategic plan, and it's really pretty simple. We need to increase the higher education attainment. We want to increase it among Kansans to 60%. Right now, we have about 41% of Kansans, maybe just a little more, that have an associate degree or higher. Now, we know not, when we say 60%, we don't say 60% baccalaureate degree because that wouldn't match the economy but 60 percent of Kansans were saying we would like to have some post-secondary credential it might be in welding it might be an HVAC it might be short term it might be a certified nurse aide uh, or it might be a baccalaureate degree or doctor degree uh, we also want to always keep in mind the alignment of our programs uh, to the needs of the economy and, and we do want to ensure the university excellence and that we're getting the kind of faculty and researchers that can really make a difference. Um, I put this in because it's kind of a technology flavor. We have loads of online education. And, and let me tell you what's happening online uh, that I think is, is, is going to really, really change. Uh, it's changing a little bit more slowly maybe than I thought, but, but yet it's coming. Does anybody remember taking online classes about 15 years ago? They were really just high-end correspondence courses, right? In other words, it was no different than getting the materials through the mail. It was just through the email or through the internet. So it, it had changed. It, it's a little bit like initially TV programs, or movies rather, I should say, where really they would film plays and that and then you would watch the movie but it was really just a, a play so so we're at a point probably and we're a little farther past this now but it used to be we just we might film the instructor lecturing and put that out the way but we're going to be moving towards it's higher cost to develop but we'll be moving towards a much more engaged type of online and it's, it's almost, we're, we're going to see more gaming, we're going to see more interactivity, uh, and we're going to see uh, learning opportunities uh, and learning engagement that's at a different level now. We're not quite there, but uh, online education used to be as online as good as face to face. It's here to stay. It's going to be a part of it. Most, many of our students, they're enrolled in three institutions of higher ed at the same time. You know, the old days of we'd go to school, stand in, you know, go to K-State in my case, stand in line with a punch card to enroll. You were in one institution, you know, those are just pretty much gone. Uh, we've had some economic recovery, not publicized uh, very well, but uh, we do know that the jobs are coming back and a difference, and it's really been going on uh, in, a, you know, in a more accelerated way since the early 70s. It used to be that some type of post-secondary education, I'm not talking about a baccalaureate degree, but some type of post-secondary education or training, which might include a baccalaureate degree, what was kind of a convenience. There wasn't, there wasn't a huge difference in pay and in stability between the job occupied by that person or the job that was really traditionally blue collar. If you think about, um, uh, if you think about some of those jobs in, in the factories and, and in the automotive industry, they were very, very high wage jobs. And now we've just seen a bigger and bigger gap and it starts in K-12. And I wanna talk about some skills that I think that everyone needs to think about. And all technology is going to do is accelerate the need for these types of skills. So, and I would tell you from an economic development standpoint, 
if you don't have the, the technology, if you don't have this broadband, this, uh, you're, you're not gonna, your community's not gonna participate in the economy at the same way as you might. You know, rural is relative. I saw this map on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> it was the globe laid out. It had a little circle over India and part of China and said more people live in that circle than outside that circle. So when we say rural, we think, you know, many people think all of Kansas is rural. Even the bustling city of Topeka, they would say, hey, that's kind of rural, you know. So, you know, it is a little bit relative. Um, we're going to have, right now we have a crisis in that the boomers are bailing, what is about 10,000 a day. Uh, we don't have an, uh, enough workforce. Our problem in Kansas is not low unemployment, high participation, those are good things to have. One of the speakers brought it up. Full employment's 4%. We're below that in many areas. We, we, we always hear we need more people. We don't need more people, we need more talented people. We have, we have got, and, and the higher ed system brings in talent. We also export talent because people choose where they're going to live. So as you think about building a community ecosystem, it has to be a place where someone, and particularly a young person, uh, wants to live. We're going to be eliminated, eliminating some of the jobs that we have today, and we're doing it right now. This is just a little factoid. I don't know. If it, you know um, we have to educate some of the workforce that's out there now. We can't just say, "Oh, it's only going to be the people entering the system." Well, then, you know, we have a lot of them. You know, a lot of us hopefully are going to live for quite a while and continue in the workforce. You know, the whole retirement thing is kind of, is kind of recent, really. My dad always said, you know, retirement's just, don't do that, that thing, you know, today is the house going on the farm. Uh, but it, it really is, there's going to be, because there's less manual labor in many of the jobs, people are going to work longer. They might work differently. You know, many people, if they get in there, it's not that old, 60s, um, they might say, well, you know what, I'm gonna work part-time, but I'm gonna continue to work. You're gonna see more, and more of that activity. We're also, there's quite a few jobs in driving right now. You know, if you look at the high demand list for Kansas, commercial driver's license, commercial truck drivers is always on there. If you drive by Topeka, Frito-Lay is hiring for $78,000 if you wanna drive uh, a semi. But here's what I tell you, I believe in 30 years, we won't be putting a rip in any aircraft. So the need for the numbers is not going to be there. You know, they talk about the deep population because Spirit Aerosystem is doing it right now, right? It's just not everybody's there. They talk about the deep population of rural America. You know, when I was in, just, just before I was born, the farm I grew up on had three or four hundred men. And it had two. And it had one. And I just drove 36. There's there was a spray coop there that can probably cover more ground than we covered in four or five days when I was a kid, seriously. I've yet to see, Patty uh, might know differently or maybe, I've yet to see them saying we just didn't have enough people to farm the ground. They, these sections had to just, they're just going to just rest. They're gonna fallow for a while because there's not enough people out here to farm it. The grounds in agriculture, it's going to produce. It just, we just need fewer people probably to do that piece of it. It's gonna be a whole new industry. And the good part is, you can live anywhere and connect to anywhere, which I think is really exciting. So we have to tell people, what's, here's something I miss about rural Kansas. I'm gonna say I'm not in rural Kansas, but okay, so. Uh, do you remember driving into town, your dad telling you, don't turn off the vehicle. <laughs> the Ford doesn't start all the time.
<laughs> so when you go to Alco and it comes, just leave it running. You know, and I remember my dad getting home one time and saying, I really miss this new police officer shut my vehicle off. You know, well, you can't leave the vehicle running. You know? So with our carbon footprint might have been a little bigger because, but you know, those are kind of things. I even thought I have a rental car today and it's a pickup truck and I pulled up, I thought, I probably don't need to lock it. I have to tell you, where I am now, I'd love to peek it, but I'll, I lock my vehicle. You know, so there's a difference. Uh, but um, these new automobiles Google's putting out, drive themselves, I expect in 15, 20 years, you're gonna see a lot of semis going down the road. Dark, three o'clock in the morning, right driving themselves, you know? Uh, I expect that'll happen. There's this website here. I'll send it to you if you're really interested. You can predict if your job's going to be done by a machine. And what's the chances? And you know, a lot of the office jobs, there's still a lot left, but there's a few that uh, have transitioned. Do you remember when you would walk into a place of business and there would be a raft of secretarial folks supporting the business. That job is gone. But what is the replacement job is a much more exciting administrative assistant job that does all kinds of high-end tasks. And you know what? We type our own letters, right? You know, we, uh, does anybody still dictate? If you do, I, I mean, I just don't see a lot, right? So, you know, these jobs are going to change. And I would argue the job coming behind them is going to be more exciting yet, and we just need to prepare our people and our communities to be ready for those jobs. So here's things that are tougher on, and don't think it's just blue collar jobs. There's gonna be many white collar jobs. Remember, these can be done anywhere in the world. Uh, so here's when it's tougher to automate. You need to come up with clever solutions. You know, we worried in welding one time. All the welders are going to be replaced by robots. Not the ones that can read a blueprint and go out themselves and construct something. You know, those are not. Now, if you're doing the four-inch coupon weld, yeah, that's the, that's the danger zone. Um, so, are you required to personally help others? Does your job require you to squeeze into small spaces? Does your job require you? negotiation. Those kind of things are going to be really hard to replace and I would also say that ethics are going to be a big part of it as well. You know, we talk about the drones flying and we have universities doing a tremendous amount of work on that technology, UAV technology. The piece that's interesting is, it's not as much, I mean it's interesting, I've, I've flown it before, and that is interesting, but who owns those data? So who flies all these fields and says, okay, I can predict the yield based on me flying a drone, and now I'm going to use that as I trade commodities. Who owns that? You know, so that's gonna be that's gonna be a big discussion. I'm out of slides, but I just always leave this. That as we increase education, and this happens to be formal, but it can be informal too. Uh, that discussion about learning on YouTube, you know, been to the Khan Academy or any of it, I mean, it's just unbelievable. But that ability and that desire to keep learning is so important. But if we increase uh, education generally, we're going to decrease unemployment, but we're going to increase earnings. And, and so it's kind of that simple as if you say, okay, what do we want our community to look like? Uh, are we going to be entrepreneurial? Are we going to be aware of the latest technologies? Are we going to utilize those technologies? Uh, and, uh, and then are we going to have an ethical uh, community as well? I think that's all something that higher ed can play a role in. I'll tell you, Brian and I are working on a project right now where we're going to build 
and infrastructure to connect more of our individuals who are in the higher ed system with a Kansas business model here. Here's the old model. The old model is, I need to hire somebody. I want a college graduate. I'll wait till they're a senior, and I'll go to a career fair in April. I'll set up a booth, people will come by. And what I would tell you is, you're way too late. Because the talent is in demand, and it's going to Houston, it's going to Chicago. It's, and so what I want to do is I want to give students the experience of Kansas early. Connect them early. Perhaps it looks like this. We're, it's still pretty wet concrete, but perhaps it looks like we help subsidize an internship when they're a sophomore or junior. And you as an employer help scholarship that student their last year, and then there's a service agreement with you for an amount of time. And you know what? If there's no love connection after that internship, and sometimes there isn't, and, and we're all interviewing each other, everybody walks away. But if there is, and there's a scholarship, that'll help reduce our student loan debt as well. It'll also give people, we don't have to tell them about how great this is, they'll get a chance to experience it. I think that's going to be important. That's all I have. I'd stand for any questions, or I'm probably out of time, and Patty's ready to close us out, but I'd stand for any questions if anybody has any. Are you involved at all with the Red Hire program? And uh, I think retirement transitions are going to be huge. Most of our businesses don't think about that much. It is closed. And uh, I think retirement transitions could be very big. Um, and I think the Red Hire program has a lot of good ideas in it. I would almost love to see that expanded to other universities, like maybe a Fort Hayes or a K-State. Can you, can you touch in on that at all? I really like the concept of the Red Tire Program because we have businesses that are, that are shuttering. Red Tire Program is that we connect young people to a business, uh, most of the time in a rural community, that, that doesn't have a, a, a legacy plan you know, for someone to come and take that business. Most businesses, they close because there's just no one there. It's not that they're not successful. You know, the, the, I think the Red Tire Program is a good start with all, they're, you know, there's some narrowing and some limitations. You have to be a certain size. Or has to be. So I think there's a lot we could do, particularly at the university level, and maybe even at the community college level, uh, that would expand that. It doesn't have to maybe be quite as formal. It doesn't have to look the same, obviously. But I think that's one other tool in, in our toolbox that can really assist. Because, you know, I think most people, uh, it's not that they don't, it's that they don't know the opportunity is there. Uh, I had a good friend whose daughter went to the University of Kansas, or we had a University of Kansas basketball fans in here. Okay, well, three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is when you get west of Urish Road, in Topeka or Wanamaker, really, it gets pretty purple, you know? And then, uh, you know, I used to, people always want to say Western Kansas because I can out Western Kansas. Anybody. You know, because when you get to Hayes, you're still two hours from the bar, you know, so. Uh, but I think people don't know about the opportunity. There's successful businesses everywhere. I have a relative who has a successful moving business. He says, you know, someday I'd like to retire. There's no way here to take it. It's wildly successful, you know. Um, and so I think that, I think we need to do more. The one thing that Brian and I have been talking about, the, the, the good thing about concept that we've talked about is that we have a I think if you're a larger business you can move right to a university campus we're seeing that in Wichita State with their bus and you can have interns come work for you while they're in school it works great what I want to see is the ability for a business to take advantage of a program like that if you only need one employee there's a lot of businesses that need one three and you know that's where a lot of growth we read about, don't chase smokes. You know, everybody's like, we could just get that manufacturer that has 400 jobs that'll say, but that's not happening anymore. Grow those businesses that have seven people, grow them to 14. Grow the one that has 14 to 20. You don't get as good a, a news story if you're in economic development. It's not as nice for you. Um, 
probably doesn't result in as big a promotion if you attract a big manufacturer. But I'm telling you, it's the low cost way to grow the company and sustainable. Any other questions? Thank you for having me. Thank you. Super high note. We have Patty Clark here with us this morning, and she is the state director for Kansas USDA Rural Development Program. And uh, since 2009, Patty Clark has served as the state director for USDA Rural Development in Kansas. She formerly served as a division director for ag marketing and community development in the Kansas Department of Commerce, and as the director of operations for the Kansas Leadership Center. And uh, I want to bring her up here right now. But most of all, before we get too far along, I want to thank you so much for all the hard work you've done this morning for putting this together on behalf of each and every one of us in this room. So, Patty Clark. Thank you. Um, I don't deserve the thanks. Blue Valley, as our host, deserves the thanks. As all the panelists and presenters, um, this was a fabulous conversation this morning. And I want to do four things as I wind it up. I want to talk about four very connected topics. One is speak honestly about the public investment that makes broadband in rural areas possible. Um, two is what does it really take to build an innovation economy? Three is pivoting the conversation about public sector, private sector collaborations. And the fourth thing I'm going to do before we leave is I'm going to lay out a challenge to the audience. So number one, um, I've spent my entire career in ag policy, agriculture, production agriculture, and rural development. Um, you know, you were talking about your view from hell um, earlier today. Has anybody lassoed baby calves from a robot before? A robot. I have. Um, flood of 88, and the mama cows could swim, the baby calves couldn't. So I, I understand agriculture. I understand the risk, the opportunity, the good, um, and the better in agriculture. Rural development, one of the stories I always tell about sense of community is I was traveling from home to Manhattan at 4 o'clock in the morning one day. And I had my electric bill um, in hand, and I had a bank deposit hand that I was going to drop at the bank in Sedan and at the electric co-op office in Sedan as I drove through. And I was not, I still hadn't had three cups of coffee yet, so I wasn't quite awake. And when I walked up to the electric cooperative drop box, um, and this was many years ago, I put both the bill, check, and my deposit in the box accidentally. And there, you know, I thought, okay. All I can do is call the electric cooperative when I get where I'm going and say, yeah, I've got my bank deposit with it. I did that. I called about 10 after 8, and Sally um, 
answer the phone. I said, Sally, I said, this is Patty. And she said, don't worry, I've already walked your bank deposit across the street. <laughs> you know, that, that's as rural as it gets. And that really personifies what is best about the quality of life of rural. Public investment. Um, since 2009, when I had the opportunity to become state director for USDA Rural Development in Kansas, um, we have invested over three billion dollars in rural Kansas. That's B, you know, billion with a B. And 131 million of it has been to our rural telecoms to build out fiber to anchor institutions like schools and hospitals and libraries and city halls, as well as to residences and businesses. It also represents investment in rural hospitals. We just financed the Omega Hospital replacement facility, almost $20 million. It represents investment in rural water districts, water and sewer projects all across rural Kansas, in education, in business development. I'm a gene, the economic gardening project we funded. And that merchant with the Main Street business in Marysville is doing tenfold revenues because of the grant that we gave to Network Kansas to bring and pilot economic gardening to rural communities and to rural businesses. And I say that, I'm not, I'm not standing up here saying, oh, look what we did. I'm saying, think about how important that is and think about what, what wouldn't be happening what wouldn't be financed? Because the commercial sector is not going to do that. They're not going to take the risk that we have been designed to take. And it's an important investment and it needs to be ongoing and it needs to be sustained. Innovation economy. Lovely, sexy words. Innovation economy. Everybody can get into that and, and have their own version of it in their own head. But what does it take? It takes strategic partnerships and strategic investment. And minus that, all you have is two words, innovation, economy. That's it. So if we're going to be a part of the innovation economy, we have to invest. And we have to do it collaboratively. And it's going to take a, a cooperation and collaboration between the public sector and the private sector. And it has to be intentional and it has to be well planned, not just to fit in today's world, in our current environment, but to project in terms of what we're going to need five years from now and ten years from now. And that leads me to pivoting the discussion, which I think is critically important to rural areas today. We keep talking in very negative bad of terms when you talk about the public sector and the private sector as though they were enemies when in fact in the history of this nation they have always worked together to grow our nation and grow our economy and we need to rename that debate civic economy market economy and they work together and the civic economy represents the investment in infrastructure, in highways, in water sewer, in electricity, in broadband, and connectivity of all of our citizens, no matter where they live. That civic economy investment also represents education. What you said, Blake, minus education, we don't compete. We aren't even in the game. Civic economy represents quality of life investments such as recreations and parks and public swimming pools, um, places where people can enjoy a higher quality of life. Civic economy means a lot of different things, but I can tell you that the market economy would not flourish as it does and will in the future without the investment in the civic economy. If you were to ask Spirit to lay all their own water lines, to 
to repave all of their roads that lead to their facility, to be a part of international finance as they are without the backing of some federal programs. I'm not sure they would be as profitable. I'm not sure they would have the revenues that they have today. They must work together. They must collaborate in a purposeful way. And we need to break down the rhetoric that the two are not connected and very divided because nothing could be further from the truth. Finally, a challenge to all of you because I think this conversation has been incredible. And thank you for the opportunity to be a part of it today. We talk about being connected, Brian. And, and you make that possible, and all the other uh, rural telecoms represented today make that possible for our rural communities and our rural citizens. I challenge each and every one of you within from today till, till Friday, and Glenn, you can talk about your you at the same time. Talk about what you heard here today on social media. Send a tweet, write a blog, throw out some comments on your Facebook pages. What did you hear? What did you think? What did you learn? What did it reinforce in your thinking or how might it have changed your perspective just a little bit? and share this story wider and wider and wider until it resonates with the non-rural communities that are not necessarily <coughs> represented in this room. Because we've got to tell that story to them and it goes back to your TED talk. If you want to eat, if you want to have a high quality of life, rural is your best partner to accomplish that. Thank you very, very much for the day, for your time, for your attention. Brian, thank you so much for hosting. Jada, thank you for having the opportunity to work with you and your staff again. These people are amazing. They are the greatest asset that we have in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for the improving quality of life in the state of Kansas for us. So thank you so much.